Welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Linda Fairbanks and I'm proud to be the president of our board of trustees. Our church has been the home of progressive religious tradition in the Peoria area for more than 177 years. Our children sum up who we are this way. This is the church of the open mind. This is the church of the loving heart. This is the church of helping hands. This is our church. Here you will find members whose positions on faith are drawn from varied religious beliefs, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, naturist, atheist, or agnostic. Members might tell you that they are religious humanists, liberal Christians, or world religionists. We are all committed to the practice of free religion. We worship, sing, play, study, teach, and work for social justice together as congregations, all while remaining strong in our individual convictions. If this is your first time with us, you catch us at an unusual time. We have just bid farewell to our interim minister, Reverend Dave Clements, and to our associate minister, Reverend Linda White. We are waiting for our new settled minister, the Reverend Jennifer Ennis, to begin her work with us on August 1st. We are excited to join in covenant with her. So our service is a little different without a minister, but I hope you enjoy. And now for our opening words by Tahir Shah from the book, In Arabian Nights, A Caravan of Moroccan Dreams. My father used to tell me that stories offer the listener a chance to escape. But more importantly, he said, they provide people with a chance to maximize their minds. Suspend ordinary constraints, allow the imagination to be freed, and we are charged with the capability of heightened thought. Learn to use your eyes as if they are your ears, he said, and you become connected with the ancient heritage of man, a dream world for his working mind.
Good morning. Today's chalice lighting is from G.K. Chesterton's book, What I Saw in America. I wish we could sometimes love the characters in real life as we love the characters in romances. There are a great many human souls whom we should accept more kindly and even appreciate more clearly if we simply thought of them as people in a story. Now is the time in our service where we share the joys and sorrows within our church community. As life would have it, today no one chose to share their joys and sorrows out loud. So I shall light one single candle to honor and acknowledge the joys and sorrows that we hold in our hearts and choose not to speak out loud. Good morning. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Brad Kefauver. I've been a member of the church for about 10 years now, and I might be better known as Kathy Carter's husband. I've had the pleasure of getting to give the message for the summer services for a few years now, ever since we switched from summer forums to regular services, and speaking in front of a friendly crowd like the UU congregation is a good experience, a good time to think about some things a little deeply, and at the end you get to shake everybody's hand, which I'm going to miss this time, but, you know, if once vaccines are finally in things, you might owe me a handshake, so, hey, that's okay. If you've been around for any of my past summer services, you might remember that I like to get real nerdy topics like zombies and Darth Vader and Guardians of the Galaxy and sometimes teddy bears once. I'm pretty much a kid at heart, and more than that, I think that our stories are important, no matter what medium they come from, if it's from movies, TVs, comic books, wherever. I, human beings love to tell stories, and stories tell us, they entertain us, they teach us, they inspire us, and they also can cause us a lot of problems. Not a lot, but some. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. Our stories are who we are. And just as human beings have flaws, our stories have flaws in them sometimes as well. For my very first summer service, I talked about the stories that I love best, the classic mysteries of Sherlock Holmes. And in that first summer service, I held up a copy of the complete Sherlock Holmes, and I compared it to a holy book, something that might help you find guidance and inspiration in its pages. This book... The complete Sherlock Holmes isn't as old as the Bible or the Koran or even the Book of Mormon, but there's wisdom in it. I mean, you can find wisdom in a lot of books. There's also a few real problems that turn up, like in many a sacred text, because these stories of Sherlock Holmes were written between 1887 and 1927. They were written by a doctor named Arthur Conan Doyle and narrated within the stories by another doctor named John H. Watson. Among the diehard fans of Sherlock Holmes, we like to pretend that Dr. Watson was the one that wrote him and that he was a historical character. It's kind of fun. Stories are really just that solid that you can, you can do that. There's a lot of historical references in them and things. And Conan Doyle wrote them very realistically, so you can do that. So today I want to talk about Dr. Watson a little bit. Um, he doesn't get the spotlight much, tagging along with Sherlock Holmes like he does. And, mainly serving as the narrator in the stories and explaining how wonderful Sherlock Holmes is at solving mysteries. In movies and TV versions of Sherlock Holmes stories, Dr. Watson has probably varied more widely than any other character in movies and TV, because they're never sure what to do with him. In the books, he's narrating, he's writing the stories, but in, in movies, what do you do with him? In the 1940s, when Nigel Bruce played him, he was a bumbling idiot. In the 1998 or 1988 movie, Without a Clue, where it was, he was the brilliant genius played by Ben Kingsley, and Sherlock Holmes was the bumbler. Dr. Watson's been a woman at least three times, played by Lucy Liu in the CBS TV show Elementary. He's, he's had a lot of different personalities. 
But if you go back to those original stories, Dr. Watson was first and foremost Sherlock Holmes's friend. And he came along, he shared the adventures, he wrote up the stories. And whether you say it was Doyle or Watson that you want to give credit for writing these stories, I'm sad to say you also have to give the same man the blame for when things go badly in the stories. And I don't just mean that the criminal gets away. When things go badly in these stories, well, it's a different kind of bad. The newest of these stories is a hundred years old at this point, almost a hundred years old. Things were different a hundred years ago, but a lot of their problems then are still our problems. One thing you'll notice in Watson's tales, it's usually foreigners bringing in all the troubles to England. There's a disease from China, a murderous little person from the South Seas, suspicious South Americans, Italian gangsters, German counterfeiters and spies, Australian convicts, and always, always, every kind of troublemaking American that you would care to name, from mobsters to religious cultists to the Ku Klux Klan, and even just normal folk coming over from America were causing trouble. We can give a we can forgive a few of those, as we do in any movies, as we know Italians aren't mafia, all South American women aren't vampires. But if you read all the 60 stories of Sherlock Holmes, you can find at least one character that nobody can forgive at this point. He occurs in the beginning of a story called The Three Gables, and his name is Steve Dixie. Steve Dixie isn't a Confederate rebel, despite his last name. No, Steve Dixie is the opposite. He's a character straight out of a minstrel show, a black stereotype played for laughs. So you can pick up the complete Sherlock Holmes and be reading along, loving Sherlock Holmes stories. You can read and read, and you can get all the way up to page 1223. Now that's 1,222 pages of writing that doesn't go off the rails. And then suddenly, on that next page, you're at a horrible 1926 minstrel show with a character that's usually played by a white man in blackface. Now, in 1926, when that story was written, even though some right-thinking folks were already calling out blackface stereotypes as a horrible form of entertainment, Al Jolson would come out with the movie The Jazz Singer, the first movie musical with sound. And at the climax of that film, the classic film, there's a minstrel show act. Now, let's put the two in context there. Movies are like the easiest thing to dismiss as part of their era. They usually have so many things that declare them something that just wasn't made today. We can easily put them in a museum, in an archive. They can have studies written on them. They aren't current entertainment. They don't pop up on HBO twice a month or show up in your Netflix queue. But a book? You can buy a copy of the complete Sherlock Holmes at Barnes & Noble any day of the year. Multiple different editions of it even. We have it drilled in our heads to revere books, not to burn books, and to treat a book with respect, even if it's not someone's gospel. And this is the point where we have problems. Because if you just read the part about Steve Dixie and the complete Sherlock Holmes, you'd say, this is a bad book, let's throw it out. There's a different story that you would have come to a full 700 pages earlier that tells a different story. In that story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson help make a man whose wife is keeping secrets from him find an answer. The wife, one of those troublemaking Americans that I spoke of earlier that Doyle liked to put in his stories, had been married before in Atlanta, Georgia, and her husband had died in an epidemic. Sherlock Holmes's client, named Grant Monroe, well, Grant and his, new white F and his new American wife, Effie, were getting along just fine until one day a new neighbor moved into the cottage next door. Grant Monroe got a look at the new neighbor as he walked by the cottage and one evening, and the face he saw in the window was pale, paralyzed, looking like something from a horror story. Now, having a weird neighbor is one thing, but then Grant Monroe catches his wife trying to sneak out at night. And then he comes home early the next day and finds her coming out of that cottage. And he rushes in there to see what's going on. And 
there's nobody in there. But the one thing he does find in that cottage on the mantelpiece is a picture of his wife. And she won't say a word about it. She won't explain anything. She just says trust her and whatever. And he just, just can't handle it. So he goes to see Sherlock Holmes. Now, this is the part where I spoil a hundred-year-old story for you, even though, you know, there, but there's 58 other Sherlock Holmes stories, not counting the Steve Dixie one that you can still read, so it won't be too bad if I spoil this one. Sherlock Holmes really doesn't do much detective work in this story. Well, he and Dr. Watson just go back to the cottage with Grant Monroe, and this time they force their way in while somebody's there, and what they find in the cottage is a little girl in a red dress and white gloves and a monster mask. They take off the mask and they find out that the little girl is black. Because Effie Monroe's first husband, back in Atlanta, was black and she had a child with him. Now according to Dr. Watson himself, this story has one of the most beautiful endings of all the Sherlock Holmes stories. When the tale of Effie Monroe's hidden daughter is revealed, Dr. Watson writes that Grant Monroe's answer was one of which I love to think. He lifted the little child, kissed her, and then, still carrying her, held out his other hand to his wife and turned toward the door. We can talk it over more comfortably at home, said he. I'm not a very good man, Effie, but I think that I am a better one than you have given me credit for being. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson slip away and leave the little family to their their business in that tender moment. But those words that Grant Monroe says, a part of that scene that Watson loves to think of, are important. I'm not a very good man, Effie, but I think I'm a better one than you have given me credit for being. Now, we know that we're not very good people all the time. And we all think that, you know, we should get credit for being our better selves, that we're the people we're trying to be. And Conan Doyle, the man that wrote these stories, was like that too. He was a very liberal Victorian. And in that story, he, it's called The Adventure of the Yellow Face, he was showing his values, putting them right out there, that he thought a mixed-race family was just like any other family. And he was a man of his times, though, and that was the problem. I mean, so he still thought it was okay to use a vaudeville stereotype for a bad guy in that other story. Conan Doyle wasn't a perfect man, but, you know, as you can see from the other story, he was trying to be a better man. Now, the thing about classic stories, the ones we read and appreciate over and over, is that they have something for us that makes them worth keeping around, even with some troubling parts like that. And even when they make us feel uncomfortable about who we were in the past. And it's good for us to be a little uncomfortable because it reminds us that we need to pay attention to the things that we have to change. If there was no racism left, a character like Steve Dixie wouldn't bother us at all. And even the less glaring things in an old story can make us feel a little uncomfortable. I'll be honest, there's not many Sherlock Holmes fans of color. And it's not just the Steve Dixie thing, it's really it's a Dr. Watson himself. Good old Dr. Watson is basically the poster child for white privilege. That's a phrase that can make us uncomfortable, the idea that things came to us by birth and not through our own efforts entirely. But let's not look at ourselves for a moment, let's look at Dr. Watson. If you read the stories closely, you'll notice that in spite of having no family in England to back him up, he somehow manages to get the education necessary to become a doctor. He goes to war, he gets wounded, he doesn't work for a very long time, he gets a wound pension from the government and it enables him to share an apartment with Sherlock Holmes for a good amount of time. And even when he starts his own medical practice, he still somehow finds the time to go running off on adventures with Sherlock Holmes whenever he feels like it. He doesn't work that hard. John H. Watson would surely not have had any of that had he been a person of color coming from a similarly humble background. It doesn't matter that Watson didn't have family behind him. It doesn't matter that he was disabled and getting government money to live. 
didn't matter that Watson didn't work as that hard as a doctor and went running off on these adventures every chance he got. John Watson succeeded in spite of all that because the world around him allowed him to. Now, it gets even worse than that when you get through these stories, because there's one point Dr. Watson helps Sherlock Holmes break into a house and they escape a murder scene together with people chasing him. And when the police come to his apartment the next day, someone actually says, Hey, one of the murderers looked just like you. And Watson doesn't get arrested. Nothing happens. He's just fine. John Watson had white privilege all week long and twice on Sunday. He's not someone to whom a black reader can easily relate. Now, what do you think Watson would say if we told him that he had white privilege? Would he start shouting about how he earned everything that he had and that anybody could go out and find the greatest detective in the world to live with and get famous? No, I think Watson knew how privileged he was. He even writes many times of what a privilege it was for him to work with Sherlock Holmes. But beyond that, John H. Watson was a man that could admit when he was wrong. Can you imagine how many times living with Sherlock Holmes that Watson had to own up to being wrong? If any human being had no chance of being a narcissist in the bubble of his own opinions, it was Dr. Watson. The guy who shares rooms with Sherlock Holmes, that smarty pants of a detective, who's always there, ready to take you down a peg, there is just no way that he's going to be able to just be too much of a self-centered egotist. If he showed Watson how out of line he was and the way he described Steve Dixie, he definitely would have listened. None of us, none of us, is ever a better person without first acknowledging we have room to grow and believing that there is better in us. In one story, we learned that Watson wanted to hang a photo of Henry Ward Beecher on his wall. Beecher fought to end slavery, came to England to rally support for the Yankees during the Civil War, and he went on to fight for women's rights when the war was over. His eyes were on better things, and Watson wanted, he admired that man. He put, wanted to put that picture on his wall. We don't know if he ever got it up there or not. Even if Watson's pen slipped on occasion, like with that stereotype character, he had good thoughts. Now, there was this better man in Dr. Watson. I mean, I think it, he shows that in the other stories. And like many a character in classic stories, he sometimes can set an example for us, if we're paying attention. You might read Sherlock Holmes stories thinking that Sherlock is the one to admire, but let me give you one good example of why Dr. Watson is somebody you can look to for a good example. Now, we've been living in fear of a virus for many months now, and at the beginning of this spring, fear had people doing stupid things like hoarding toilet paper. And, you know, frightened people get selfish and silly. Some people are also a little frightened when the protests started after George Floyd was killed by a police officer. At that time, we also saw that there were people that wanted us to have that fear. They want us to look at every protest and fear a damaging riot. They want us to look at reform and fear that something's going to be taken away from us. They want us to look at people different from ourselves and fear that they're going to hurt us somehow just because we don't understand them completely. But they're not like us. Those things are in our heads, those very little, little tiny human fears that are natural, born of our roots in more primitive times. And they work against us in the modern day. They make it too easy for us to let the wrong people have power just because we give in to those fears, and we've seen too many examples of that lately. Like the coronavirus, you just can't pretend fears aren't there. You have them, I have them. And racism isn't just putting on minstrel shows and burning crosses. Sometimes it's about fear. And here's where we can learn a lesson from Dr. Watson. Watson wasn't just brave because he was a soldier. Watson wasn't just brave because his best friend was Sherlock Holmes. No, John H. Watson was brave for the most important reason of all. And I'll get to that from with another story. There's a scene in another story called a story called The Adventure of the Devil's Foot that really gets to the heart of Watson's character. In that story, something happens that has killed a woman and driven her brothers insane. Sherlock Holmes deduced it's some kind of toxic fumes from a burning powder 
and to test his theory, he starts burning some of the powder while he and Watson are sitting next to it, thinking that the amount he's using isn't that strong. That might sound incredibly stupid at this point, but remember this was the Victorian era when doctors were always testing things on themselves. Now, as the deadly fumes took hold of Watson and Holmes in that story, Watson's imagination runs wild, and every one of his senses starts screaming at him that something horrible is coming, something just terrible. The exact words he uses to describe the thing are, all that was monstrous and inconceivably wicked in the universe. He writes of feeling that this horror is coming, whose very shadow would be enough to destroy him, and he feels his hair rising and his eyes widening with terror. And he tries to scream, but he can't. He's just paralyzed with fear and despair. He's totally paralyzed. He's frightened beyond anything he's ever seen. It's like everything is coming out of his brain that can't frighten him. And, you know, he's just at that ultimate level of fright. But even with that level of paralyzing, screaming fear coursing through him, John Watson looks over and sees another person. And I don't think it matters who that person was. Watson sees that other person with the same features that he's seen on the dead. And in that moment, he draws together this instant of strength and sanity, just based on that sight that this other person might be dead, and overcomes his fear. Fear is there, but John Watson's concern in that moment isn't for himself. It's for that other human being in the room. And his lifelong commitment to helping people, to fending off death itself as a doctor, that's what comes in. And, and that need to help others, what drives him out of his chair. He can get up, grab the person, who is Sherlock Holmes, by the way, drag him out the front door, saves both of them. And that's where Watson's courage comes from, wanting to help another human being. That's the lesson from Dr. Watson that I think we need to focus on right now in these times. I mean, to see how the lives of others are being threatened and push through our fears to do what we can to help. Without that impulse, without that drive, to help another, Watson would have been either insane or dead after the toxic fumes took him and all that. If he only thought of himself, the fear and the paralysis would have stopped him. But no. Watson looked beyond himself. He looked at that other person, and he found something that pushed him to move on. See, and that's kind of where we are right now. We've got this, this nightmare going on that we can only get through if we try to save others instead of saving ourselves. To push past our fears and our own pride. And to try to help the other guy, just like Watson did. Now that's a good lesson from these stories from any era. That's why we hang on to stories like this, despite the weird little racist parts. You know, a hundred years old, parts are bad, there's all kinds of weird little goofiness in them. But there are these good things. Things that can inspire us to be better people. And I'll let you in on a little secret. In Japan, China, India, and so many other countries where the Sherlock Holmes stories have been translated into other languages, Sherlock Holmes is a person of color. In all those stories where that the words have been translated into those people's own languages, Sherlock Holmes is one of their own. And they love him just as much as we do. Same story, different words. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing, because you do change the words when you translate a story into another language, but the story stays the same. And in another few years, the Sherlock Holmes stories, the copyright of them, they just fall out of copyright completely. At which point, it's totally legal to change the words in these classic stories. Maybe get rid of somebody like Steve Dixie in there. Now, this is where we meet a little challenge because we're used to the words, we want to keep the words, we get that, you know, it's hard for us to let go of something like that, even though it's kind of horrible. But, you know, the story remains the same, even with different words. Dr. Watson, like the rest of us, 
could have a chance to be a better person in the future than he was in the past. And as with ourselves, you know, we have to admit his failings like we admit our own things that might not help others and try to move past that. Real change takes honesty. Real change takes empathy and unselfishness. And real change takes more courage than we might feel like we have sometimes. But like Watson in that room filled with clouds of poison, hallucinogenic, toxic fumes, in that room where he felt like the most horrible things were coming at him, well, like Watson then, we can maybe find the strength to look at another human being and see that maybe they need our help, and maybe we can do something about that. These stories that we tell each other, these wonderful stories, are road signs pointing us along a path where we can make our own stories worth telling one day. If we can just see what folks like Dr. John H. Watson have to teach us. Thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Today's closing words are from Through the Magic Door by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I care not how humble your bookshelf may be, nor how lowly the room it adorns. Close the door of that room behind you. Shut it off with all the cares of the outer world. Plunge back into the soothing company of the great dead, and then you are through the magic portal into that fair land whither worry and vexation can follow you no more. You have left all that is vulgar and all that is sordid behind you. There stand your noble, silent comrades, waiting in their ranks. But alas, though you shut that door, you cannot seal it. Still come the ring of the bell, the call of the telephone, the summons back to the sordid world of work and men and daily strife. And yet, now that the portal is open and we stride out together, do we not face our fate with a braver heart for all the rest and quiet and comradeship we found behind the magic door?